that this world is backwards and upside down. So we have things like, I would say, we call industrialized nations and what the world calls civilized nations. And then we have cultures like the Aborigines over there in, mm. in Australia. Mm. Uh, at many, in many cases, very telepathic, what yeah. the world would judge as very primitive. Yeah. But again, yeah. since everything is backwards and upside down, yeah. or in this book, and the series of light, yeah. I mean, you had in Europe a, a group of beings that would sit still in the silence hey. Hey. and heal the world yeah. through their nurturing stillness. Yes. Yeah. Now, my journey has taken me to all these different countries, and the sneaky thing about the ego is, is that the ego invents a lot of rules and regulations and rituals in this world that are designed to minimize fear. Why do we have traffic signals? Why do we have prisons? Why do we have uh, regulations and judges and so forth? It's, it's to hold down fear. In other words, the, people, the belief is, if we didn't have all these rules, uh, the world would really be chaos. You think it's chaos now without some rules and structure. Yeah. But what I've noticed as I've traveled around the world is I've actually gone in some cultures in South America where they don't, they don't have such rules and regulations. For example, in Buenos Aires, it's a city of over 15 million people. Oh. 15 million, more than that, and they don't have stop signs. They don't have no stop signs. No stop signs in Buenos Aires. Now imagine, practically speaking, if you were living in a city of 15 million people with how many intersections? Millions of intersections and no stop signs. Now what does this do? Well, what you would have to do is you would soon have to be what? Very telepathic. Uh, if you were a cab driver. And imagine down there, because the economy has collapsed, they tried, they didn't hold hold their currency contingent with the dollar and with other currencies, so their whole economy completely collapsed. And doctors and lawyers and teachers and professionals had to take up jobs like cab drivers. Uh, because, but it actually was an advance in their career to go from doctor to cab driver. Because you have to be telepathic in that place and you have to tune into the intuition. You see how backwards it is? And the cab driver, I had one cab driver who was so happy and peaceful that I was doing the Course in Miracles gatherings. His name was Juan. I said to Juan, would you come in and speak at the Course in Miracles gathering? I asked the cab driver to come in and speak. And he said, yes, I would be glad. And he went in and he, he was very calm. He told a parable of detachment. The cab driver did. Now, what I'm saying is, is when we talk about civilizations and rules and regulations, it's the, kind of like the same topic of insurance, that you have to start to become more and more intuitive and get in touch with divine laws in your mind. And to do that, you will have to release these other ones. We've all been raised with the laws of nutrition, the laws of medicine, the laws of economics. Some of them, we know these laws like the back of our hands. We can tell you all about the body and nutrition and this and that. You know what? It's not going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, because guess who made all these laws up? The ego. The ego made them all up. And what's going to get you out of it is your intuition. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles. He was, uh, he was beginning to undo the laws of nutrition 2,000 years ago. It's your thoughts. If you're thinking without grievances and judgments, that's where your, your health starts with mental health. And, and you know what he says in the Course? He says, all illness is mental illness. So if you follow him, what he's saying is, your, your health starts and ends with your thinking. It starts and ends. So all I've done in my life is I've been very honest, and I started to question all those laws of nutrition, of economics, of medicine, exercise. I was trained in the laws of exercise. <laughs> what happens if you don't exercise? What happens to muscles if you don't exercise? They're, we're told they waste away. We're told that they atrophy. But what I find, I had been a professional tennis instructor. I went to the gym. I did cardiovascular fitness and this and this. I'll tell you right now, what's for me, then the turnaround is the shift in my thinking. 
You know, I had to learn, even when I was going to the gymnasium, to have holy encounters and to start to perceive my brother as myself, instead of focusing on their body, I had to learn a different way. So, so yes. So, what if your body is completely broken? Take, take my friend Ross. Take my brother. Where your body has completely a, a problem that seemingly can't be fixed. What do you do with that? If you want to be able to get up and walk again or whatever. Is that still up here? Well, that's where you stick in. You would start and you would end with mind training. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you seem to be in a wheelchair or not in a wheelchair, you still, your mind goes with you wherever you go. And what you could say is, your mind training is something, when we talk about releasing your mind from judgments, uh, I could tell you so many stories. Uh, I'll tell you one story of, of meeting a man in uh, Argentina who was a paraplegic. And it was, I was meeting with a psychiatrist in uh, Argentina, and and he finally, we were having lunch, and he said, David, would you like to meet my teacher? And I said, yes, take me to your teacher. So we went down by this big river, and there was a man who's about 26 years old sitting in a wheelchair, and the psychiatrist who's probably about 55, 60, a very famous psychiatrist down there, introduced the man in the wheelchair and said, here's my teacher. He has taught me more about life and love and forgiveness than anyone uh, that I've ever met. And then I sat, sat down and, and the man who was in the wheelchair and I sat there and we gazed at each other and, and I said to him, tell me your story. Tell me your story. You seem very happy. And he said that he had been able to walk and he was able to walk and move around but um, when he was about 2001 he was diagnosed with a tumor on his spine, and he was told that he would have to go in for an operation that was very risky and that he may not walk after the operation. So he went under anesthesia on September 11th of 2001. And he went under anesthesia, uh, which what would have been in the early morning hours of the United States, and he went under anesthesia. And while he was under anesthesia, they operated on the tumor, and when he woke up, he had no use of his legs, and he was in such a state of ecstasy, and such a state of oneness and happiness, that the doctors and nurses tried to tell him, uh, while you are under anesthesia, a terrible, terrible tragedy uh, has occurred in the United States. Terrible tragedy. And he, he, did, he could not comprehend uh, what they were trying to tell him. He told me, from his wheelchair that he went through that experience when he was under anesthesia where it seemed like his ego was operated on <laughs> instead of the tumor. He said, I don't know what happened, whether I was in a deep state of prayer or whatever, but he woke up and he said his personality self, his, his pride, his jealousy, his envy and everything had been lifted and he woke up in a state of ecstasy and his legs didn't work. So it, this is quite an interesting uh, parable because he ended up becoming a teacher to many people in Buenos Aires that would come to him for spiritual uh, training and counseling. And yet his spiritual career didn't, didn't uh, actually begin until he seemed to lose his life. Now, again, if everything is backwards and upside down in this world, People ask me all the time about teaching, and I say, we really don't teach with our words. Uh, we're used to thinking about that. We teach with our attitude. It's our attitude that is the teacher. This young man, you know, people would say, well, at least he could walk before uh, he had this experience. I say, what do you mean, at least he could walk? Uh, his attitude is what's doing the teaching. 